Last time we watched Goku continue to grow as a Kai, unlocking a brand new ability of his own. Actually, two in fact, getting access to Super Saiyan Rose, and then combining that with Evolve Kao Can for his own form, Crimson Kai. But where does he go from here? We'll be seeing all that and more in this part 7 of What If Goku Became Kami. Goku continuously meets with Zamasu to work with him more. Of course, he does return to Earth occasionally. Piccolo, Vegeta, and Gohan have all grown on their own. The thing is, though, Zamasu kind of worries him. Plus, Zamasu is a strong opponent, so it's nice to fight against him too. Although, when Goku does show off his full power, it's obvious it's going to be way too much for Zamasu. But he does admire the form. Something about that rosé hair, it feels like Zamasu's seen that before. He can't quite put his finger on why, but he likes it. It looks pretty nice. But regardless, he could tell that's a form for a real divine being. And Goku acts very differently around Zamasu here, mostly acting formal because he's usually casual with other Kais, but recognized that he needs to appeal to Zamasu here somehow. And Zamasu does find Goku fascinating. He seems to uphold all the values of a Kai. So even though he's a mortal that's been put into that position, Zamasu doesn't necessarily oppose him. And the more he gets to know Goku, the more he starts to grow to like him. Seeing that mortals can actually be truly amazing. Of course, this doesn't happen quickly. It's going to happen over a long period of time. Goku is able to change people pretty easily, and he kind of has to do the same as Zamasu here, which is a much tougher task. But as they spend time together, Zamasu learns a lot more about mortals. And he also gets to see a bit of Goku's training. Apparently, Goku's trying to access something that Whis is teaching him, a mastery over automatic movements in the body. Now, Goku isn't too sure of what it is, and Whis isn't giving him a direct answer for it, obviously. But Zamasu feels like he knows about this. He's heard about this before. It's Ultra Instinct, isn't it? Since he's still not fully sold on mortals, he doesn't give Goku the answer right away. Plus, even if he did fully like mortals at this point, giving Goku the answer flat out removes the fun. He does want to see if Goku's able to achieve something like this. It would probably take hundreds or thousands of years, though. Only the angels have ever been able to pull that off. There's no way a mortal or anyone else could even do that. But something about Goku's different. It does stick in his mind. So, obviously, we skipped a few arcs. There's no Universe 6 tournament. There's obviously no Goku Black arc because Zamasu here is good, and there's no Time Traveler. And on top of that, there's not going to be a tournament of power. Without the Universe 6 tournament, Zeno never gets the idea for another one, although he still does have the idea in mind that he might want to erase some of the universes. And just to see if there's any reason to keep them around, he visits them. Some have been improving, but mostly, they're still disappointing. But at one point, he does go to Beerus' planet, meeting up with the God of Destruction and Angel there, also seeing someone else there. He's intrigued to see a mortal here, especially one that's apparently working to be a Kai now. Well, he actually corrects Zeno. He's just Guardian of Earth with some really good connections. And while he was extremely formal with Zamasu, He's pretty casual with Zeno until he realizes who he actually is. But by the time he realizes who Zeno is, it's already too late. He just acts like his normal self in front of Zeno, which is a good thing. Zeno actually likes this guy. This mortal interests him. Maybe there's something that can be done about the universes. Maybe there's interesting people within them and Zeno just needs to look harder, because like this guy over here, he seems pretty fun. Obviously no one knows that he's going to erase the universes, but in Zeno's mind he thinks maybe he should keep them around a little longer. Maybe they can do something impressive. And with how big all the universes are, there's no way this is just exclusive to Universe 7. There has to be interesting people in other universes too. If only there was some way to get them all together and fight just to see how strong they are, and give them some sort of test of their powers too, as well as their will. But he can't really think of anything. Oh well, he goes back to his palace, leaving happy now that he met Goku. Despite this story being about Goku, we have focused a lot on him, so let's go back to Earth to cover what's going on there. At some point throughout all of this, Beerus does eventually visit Earth again while Goku's gone. He needs something to occupy himself, and there's a lot of good food here, so he might as well. And this gives Vegeta the perfect opportunity. He's been training for as long as he can. Piccolo and Gohan have helped him, but really no one knows what they're working towards. But together, he and Gohan have unlocked something amazing. Now, Gohan's not present at the moment because he doesn't really have a desire to go to Beerus' planet, but he likes the fact that he has grown stronger here. But due to him having his own dormant godly key, after some intense training with Vegeta and Piccolo, he unlocked a brand new form for himself. And Vegeta unlocked it not too long after, picking up on the godly key for himself, too. And he has the perfect chance to show it off against Beerus here. He immediately meets Beerus and Whis, and just transforms right in front of them, showing off a brand new godly form, one that no one's ever seen before. It's the true Super Saiyan God form. And Beerus can tell by the aura, it's definitely something divine. He wonders what this form actually is. Maybe this is the Super Saiyan God form that Goku was supposed to get, but because of his unique origins and such, he ended up skipping it completely and getting something different. Of course, the form that Vegeta's using is also weaker than what Goku currently has. And Vegeta's been surpassed long ago, but this does kind of interest Beerus. And you know, Goku's not always on his planet training. He hops between the sacred world of Kai's, both in Universe 7 and Universe 10, he goes to the lookout on Earth, and sometimes he is on Beerus' planet, but it's not all the time. So maybe Beerus can have a new rival here. 
Little does he know, Gohan has the same form too, and he's actually above Vegeta right now. But this is Vegeta's chance to finally get ahead. He's gonna go to Beerus' planet and train there, going beyond this form and getting stronger than even Kakarot is. After so long, his hard work finally paid off. Long ago, he believed as an elite Saiyan, he just couldn't be surpassed, but Kakarot proved him wrong. Although now that he's putting more hard work in for himself, he's done it. He was the first Super Saiyan, and technically, he's the first to use the real Super Saiyan God form. And he's gonna be the first to go beyond it too, not realizing Goku's already gone beyond it, pretty much twice. But Beerus does see some potential within Vegeta, so he comes along to Beerus' planet. And Vegeta wonders where he should go next from here. He doesn't really have an idea, he just knows that he has to go beyond this form somehow. But eventually he'll cross paths with Kakarot again. He does catch him here on Earth from time to time, but now on Beerus' planet, it's going to be a lot easier to see him. And at some point they do get to fight together, with Goku impressed at how much he's grown. Also surprised to learn that Gohan apparently has the same form. He's really missed out on some things on Earth. Yeah, he's been keeping a watch over the planet like he should as Guardian, but he hasn't been focused on the little things. He's mainly been focused on keeping any threats away from Earth, and thankfully Earth has been peaceful. But he's missed out on all the good stuff too. Of course, he still is above Vegeta, but Vegeta has grown considerably, and he commends Vegeta for it, hoping that he actually does find a way to surpass that form. Because it looks like the two of them essentially have completely different paths now. They're similar, but different because of their unique circumstances. And Vegeta also meets Majin Buu, who's in a pretty weird position right now. Surprisingly, he's kind of acting like a Kai here. Shin and Kibito have worked on trying to separate the other Kais out of him, but they can't. Although, there are times where Buu turns into the Grand Supreme Kai for some reason. They don't know the workings behind it, but they know that the Grand Supreme Kai is in there, and somehow he's manifesting himself through Buu. He does train with Goku from time to time, but now he's more so a Kai than anything. Goku purifying him was an amazing thing. Well, for the most part at least. There is one kind of bad thing that comes out of it. In Buu, or rather the Grand Supreme Kai, he's able to take notice. And the Grand Supreme Kai was pretty worried about this when he came back. Despite Boo being alive, when he was purified, that did break the seal a bit for Moro. Now, it was still partially intact, but it started something that Moro could easily finish, and he was able to break the rest of the seal himself. With it being unstable, that means Moro is able to break free from the Galactic Patrol prison. And immediately when this happens, Boo is able to sense it, warning the other Kais of it and telling them to get Goku here. Of course, the Galactic Patrol is scrambling to figure out what to do for themselves, but little do they know, the gods of this universe are working on something. The rest of the patrol wonders why Maris is so content about this, but he thinks this will be all okay. Obviously, he can't tell them why, but he knows that the Kais are on top of this, including one particular mortal that he knows. Thanks to his brother Whis telling him, Goku gets a few allies with him, Boo, Zamasu, and Vegeta. Vegeta's there as some extra muscle. By the time this all happens, he actually has surpassed Super Saiyan God, getting a form that kind of looks like Goku's rosé form, but it's completely blue instead. So he'll be nice as an extra bit of strength. Boo's there because the Grand Supreme Kai actually knows about Moro, and he's able to manifest himself through Boo more and more, with Boo also being able to help. Alongside that, Boo, Zamasu, and of course Goku all have access to magic that could be used to counter Moro. They're not going unprepared. Even though this isn't Zamasu's universe, he's coming along because he was with Goku not too long ago. They want to see what kind of a threat he's facing. Apparently it's some old magical threat from the past, one that is related to the Kais. And considering it's an enemy of the gods, Zamasu wants to see that enemy defeated. It could be a good learning experience too. Goku teleports them all to Namek. They know of Moro's magic because of Boo telling them, so they know he's going to be able to absorb energy, but Vegeta's the first one to step up and fight. He paces himself, eventually working his way up to Super Saiyan Blue, and Moro is not able to fight him at all, which is surprising because Moro is trying to steal his energy, but he can't get anything. He doesn't know, but watching nearby, there's Boo and Zamasu, concealing their presence. The only other person that he actually sees is Goku, but the second Moro started using his magic, someone started interfering, and he doesn't know who, but it's those three. Vegeta's about to get the kill on Moro, but Moro's able to make an escape, barely getting away. He doesn't know how they knew he'd get to Namek in the first place. It's like they knew he was gonna come here and met him here beforehand. Moro tries to get in contact with Cranberry too, but he seems to be dead, and someone else picks up his communication device, telling Moro he's already lost. It's Zamasu on the other end. Having prevented Cranberry from getting the Dragon Balls, Goku then teleports around to pick everybody up, teleporting in front of Moro and stopping him in his tracks. He doesn't seem to know who he's up against, does he? Vegeta asked Goku if he'd like to take this, but no, it was Vegeta's fight. He'll let him finish it. Good. Vegeta was hoping he'd be able to test out this form. He powers up to his full strength, and with the others helping by preventing Moro from using magic, Vegeta's able to kill Moro completely. With Zamasu kind of happy to watch on too, despite there being some bad morals out there, and despite him not really liking Vegeta using a divine form, he's content with this, seeing the good mortals team up with the gods to win. More and more, he's getting to see that he's wrong about the mortals. His view on them is completely changing especially thanks to Goku. He truly is a divine figure. 
at Zeno's palace, he's watching all the battles go on in this universe, and he's enjoying what he sees. Although, he really wants to see more of Goku, and wonders if he'll ever have an all-out battle. It's kind of been a while since he has had one. And every day he's growing stronger. Beerus hasn't fought him in a while either, but it's pretty clear to see. Goku may even be above him already. In the rare instances where he does show off his Crimson Kai form, it's easy to tell. It's been continuously improving and it's not going to stop anytime soon. But a real challenge for Goku is about to appear. This entire time on Earth, there has been one threat that's been dormant. One that Goku was never able to pick up on because it never posed a threat. Well, actually there's two in development. Red Pharmaceuticals is trying to work on a plan to stop Goku. Of course, they don't have the idea for Cell Max in mind because they don't know about Cell. They want to build some more androids, but they have no idea of what to do. They're able to break Dr. Hedo out of prison, but he doesn't really want to work for them. For the time being, he has no real directives, but he does begin his own research. But this isn't the main threat that they're about to face. There's an intruder at the Red Pharmaceuticals base at one point, and it's no human fighter, but it's not alien either. It's something else completely different. Nobody knows who or what this thing is. He's trying his best to keep his power low because he has a lot of power now. Also, a lot of unique abilities. But he's not at his full strength yet. He makes his way through Red Pharmaceuticals looking for one person, Dr. Hedo. The person who could make him perfect. His name is Cell, a creation by one of Hedo's relatives, Dr. Jiro. Now unfortunately for Cell, he can't achieve perfection. As far as he knows, Android 17 and 18 are dead. Obviously they have been revived, but he doesn't know that. His drones didn't see Goku use Shenron to revive them. But it's alright. He has someone here who can make him perfect. He just needs Dr. Hedo to make the parts for him. Or any scientist here for that matter. Now of course, they're not going to give him that easily, especially with who this guy seems to be. A completely rogue bio-android created by Dr. Jiro. But Magenta and Carmine kind of like this. You know, they needed a good android to work against Goku. And it seems Cell has the same directives. Of course, they don't know if they could actually trust him. But if they don't help Cell, he's going to kill them anyways. They might as well work together against the same enemy, shouldn't they? And Cell's starting to like these two. Although Hedo, he's still not really up for it, and he's the only one who can do this. But Magenta reminds him, they're paying Hedo to do this. He's gotta listen to them. And Cell warns Hedo too, be sure to not do anything stupid. For example, giving him parts that are able to shut him down or self-destruct or something, because that won't work on him. He can't shut down because he's not mechanical, and if he does put some sort of self-destruct device in there, it doesn't matter, he'll regenerate. Hedo would have to build a bomb capable of destroying the entire galaxy. No, one capable of almost destroying the universe maybe. And that's just for Cell's current power. Imagine how strong he'll be when he's truly perfect. And if they don't listen to him, he could simply just blow up Earth right here now. Of course, that wouldn't be as fun, and it's kind of an empty threat from him. But would they rather see their planet get destroyed immediately, or would they rather help Cell out and let him have some fun here? So reluctantly, Hedo does have to help him, with Cell continuing to remain low-key, eventually able to finally achieve his goal, perfection, undergoing a staggering transformation. In case you couldn't tell, this is the present version of Cell, not a time traveler or anything like that. Dr. Jiro's lab was never found beforehand, so even though the androids were stopped, Cell wasn't. He was still developing this entire time, and his drones kept collecting data. Now initially at some point they did stop, but the computer continued to monitor everything and thought maybe there's some interesting things Cell could pick up on. Of course the drones had to remain cautious. If they were noticed, the entire thing would be done. So they don't really have data on stuff like Beerus and Whis, because they knew if they got too close to Beerus and Whis, they'd probably be spotted. But they've gotten a lot of other data besides that, as well as some extra DNA for Cell. So even though this perfect Cell looks like the one that we all know, he's completely different. He's not even from the same timeline, nor does he have the same backstory. But now that he's perfect, he has no use for the Red Ribbon Army, or Red Pharmaceuticals, whatever they're going by now. With a flick of his finger, he completely destroys the base, leveling it and killing everybody in there. Well, almost everybody. Thanks to hardening his skin, one person was able to barely survive, Dr. Hedo. He actually saw this coming, and you know, as much as he dislikes Jiro, the idea of having a secret underground lab was a pretty nice one, so this entire time he had his own one built. Even with the Red Ribbon Army base destroyed, he still has a ton of resources. It's up to him to stop Cell. Or so he thinks. As he goes to his own secret underground lab, starting to build the androids that he actually wanted to build. The Gammas. This is where we'll leave off for now. What'd you guys think about this part, and what's gonna happen next time now that we have our true final villain? Let me know your thoughts below. Be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help out the channel. Anyways, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in my next video.